Matthew chapter 5, we've been studying through, uh, we're starting a study here in the Gospels, and so we're just working our way through Matthew right now. And tonight we come to Matthew chapter 5, the Sermon on the Mount, and not too long ago, I don't know exactly how long it's been, I, I think in times that uh, we've probably been in this study a little longer than, than I think or imagine, uh, but prior to that we had studied through some of the Beatitudes and we talked about them at the time, so... This will kind of be more of a general overview of the Sermon on the Mount as we kind of come through this section of Matthew and we kind of look at what's going on. And so prior to this, we know that in the opening chapters of Matthew, we have the, uh, the lineage of Christ as, as king. We have him in his sovereignty. Uh, that that uh, lineage then shows him where he's got the rightful heir to the throne. And so then we kind of moved into the last couple of weeks. We talked about um, his baptism. We talked about the temptation. And then we talked last week about that beginning of his earthly ministry. And so tonight, I would like to start in Matthew chapter 4 again and read verse number 12. And kind of move us into chapter 5 where we're going to start tonight. And in Matthew chapter 4, notice in verse number 12, it says, Now when Jesus had heard that John was cast into prison, he departed into Galilee. And leaving Nazareth, he came and dwelt in Capernaum, which is upon the sea coast in the borders of Zebulun and Nephilim. That it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, The land of Zebulun and the land of Nephilim, by the way of the sea, beyond Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles. The people which sat in darkness saw great light, and to them which sat in the region, and shadow of death, light is, spring up, is sprung up. From that time Jesus began to preach and to say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And Jesus, walking by the sea of Galilee, saw two brethren, Simon, called Peter and Andrew his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishers. And he said unto them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. And they straightway left their nets and followed him. And going on from thence, he saw other two brother, brethren, James the son of Zebedee, and John his brother, in a ship with Zebedee their father, mending their nets, and he called them. And they immediately left the ship and their father and followed him. And Jesus went about all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing all manner of sickness and all manner of disease among the people. And his fame went throughout all Syria, and they brought unto him all sick people that were taken with diverse diseases and torments, and those which were possessed with devils, and those which were lunatic, and those that had the palsy, and he killed them. And there followed him a great multitude of people from Galilee and from the Decapolis, from Jerusalem and from Judea, from the, and from beyond Jordan. Seeing the multitudes, he went up into a mountain, and when he was set, his disciples came unto him, and he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you again for the word of God. Lord, we thank you for the blessing of the bells. Uh, Lord, that you've given us so many ways to praise you, so many ways to bring glory to your name. Lord, I thank you that I've heard the song tonight. Holy, 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 what a holy God we serve tonight. Lord, we can only imagine that one day we'll be in your presence. We are all the angels to sing. Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. Lord, in the meantime, again, we ask you to help us to honor you in our lives, to represent you well on this earth. And we ask tonight for a special blessing in your Holy Spirit to open the Word of God to our hearts, to our minds, to our eyes and ears. Help us to understand, Lord, the things that you have for us to do. It's in Jesus' precious name. As we look at this, we kind of come into this section, and we said last week that as Christ begins his earthly ministry, he moves away from Nazareth. That's where he grew up as a boy, so he's a Nazarene. He's not a Nazarite. A Nazarite took a vow. They had their longer hair. They couldn't touch wine. They, there were some very specific things that they couldn't do. Jesus was from Nazareth, so he's a Nazarene, and so he grew up there. But it says when he begins his earthly ministry, these last about three and a half years that he was on earth, he begins to go out. And he begins to minister to people. And, and what strikes me is that on his heart was you and I, both Jew and Gentile, all men, whosoever will may come. And he went out into the world. And yes, we know there were some specific things to the Jew, but he really he moves into the Galilee, right? We said last week, the Galilee of the Gentiles. And it was called this because this was the area where the Gentiles lived. North of Judea was this area uh, called Samaria. And we know what the Jews thought of the Samaritans. Just above that is this area of Capernaum. It's on that northwest corner of the sea up there, the Sea of Galilee. Then you have Syria. So all those wicked kings that would come down through Syria would come down into um, uh, that area of Capernaum and into Samaria and then would attack Jerusalem, would attack the Jews down there. 
And so we have this area up there. When Christ leaves Nazareth, he goes straight to that area where the Gentiles are, where those that are hated by the religious proper. And he goes to minister to them. Notice the message that he preached to them in verse number 17. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Now for the Jew, that was the Messiah. Their promised Messiah was on earth. The kingdom of heaven was at hand. It could have been ushered in at any moment, but they rejected him. They rejected the fact that he was the Messiah. And ultimately, within three and a half years, you're going to hang him on a cross and call him a hypocrite. Call him that arrow kinds of names because nobody can claim to be the Son of God without being God. And yet we know from our Bibles tonight that he was God. He was God in the flesh. And so Christ was here on earth, and yet the Jews rejected him. We looked in Isaiah, these prophecies. He was also preaching to the Gentiles. Tonight for you and I, the message is repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. At any moment, Christ could split the skies, and we could be in his presence. We could be tonight, before the night is over, before the clock strikes midnight, we could be in heaven tonight singing, holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. What a blessing that would be, but are you, am I, prepared to stand before holy God tonight? If there's something in my life that I would say, oh, Lord, help me. Lord, um, if I've got any question, any restraint, I better get that right with God. Because it could be in the next 30 seconds. It might be in the 30, next 30 days. We don't know. But it could be at any moment. So it says, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The first thing I want us to notice is that the place where the Sermon on the Mount was preached is a mountain near the sea. Notice again, verse number 1. He sees the multitudes. He went up into a mountain. And when he was set, the disciples come unto him. And so we know this mountain area had to be close to the sea because he went to Capernaum. He's on that northwest shore of the Sea of Galilee, and he begins to teach up there. He's moving around up there. And now it says he sees the multitudes, all these people that see these miracles and things that he's doing, all the healing. And so he moves up into the mountain. So the mountain wasn't far from the sea. Another indicator would be that he had just called some fishermen. Some were on the, on the shore mending their nets. Others were on the boat. He calls them, and they leave their father. They leave the fishing business. They leave the industry behind. Everything they knew, that was their family business. Christ called them, and immediately it says they began to follow him. So he's in this mountain area close to that sea there, and he's calling these fishermen to come and become fishers of men. Another indication would be that he is there uh, with the, with the uh, multitude, and they're following him. He's, this is where he's been doing this, these miracles. And they begin to follow him. This multitude, they're looking for those miracles. Uh, they're not really interested maybe in the message that he has. But they want to bring everybody to him that can be healed. And so this ministry that's there. The sermon was probably delivered near a place called Tabga. It's north of Tiberias and west of Capernaum. And so we have this mountain range that runs up along the side of the sea to the west of the sea. And then the mountain range kind of goes up into the northwest from there. And so it's a small little mountain range, and in that range would be the, uh, the Tiberian Mountains. And so he moves just west of Capernaum. But we saw last week that he had moved there uh, after leaving Nazareth. This is where he went. His ministry begins in Capernaum, and now he moves up into this mountain. When he's done at the conclusion of the sermon, though, he'll return to Capernaum. Look at Matthew chapter 8. Look at Matthew chapter 8. So this area, this is where he chose to begin this earthly ministry. He moves up into Capernaum. He now, with this big crowd that's there, he moves into the mountains. And we'll show you in a, reason, in a minute why. But I want to show you when he's done. Now it says in verse number uh, 28, look at Matthew 7, 28. It says, that he, And it came to pass, when Jesus had ended these sayings, the people were astonished at his doctrine. For he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. So he's, he's finishing up his teaching. Matthew 5 through 7 is this Sermon on the Mount. If you think I went long this morning, imagine one through Matthew 5, 6, and 7. Christ was busy. He had no hurry. He was going to spend time and invest in people, and they needed to hear the truth. When it, in verse number 1, when he came down from the mountain, great multitudes followed him. Then notice verse number 5, and when Jesus was entered into Capernaum, there came unto him a centurion deceiving. So in my mind, I begin to think, here he is, he's busy, he begins to call his disciples, he's going to eventually send them out as apostles, he'll begin to lie the foundation work of the church, they're going to have signs and miracles, things that they can do that are going to show their calling, and Christ, uh, the ability that Christ has given them, that this is the church, that no longer is the gospel primarily to Jew, it's now open completely to Jew and Gentile.
Gentile, and God is going to begin working in this age of grace. Again, uh, the missionary letter mentioned dispensations. We believe in the dispensational uh, look at the scriptures. Okay, some churches, some people will call them and be like, Pastor, are you dispensational? And they'll want to argue on the phone why they don't think we ought to be. You can argue all day long, just you don't have to come if that's not what you believe. Um, but that's their argument. And so throughout the scriptures, Paul even says in the dispensation of grace, and that's where we live today. And the dispensation is simply the way God works with man, the way God's interacting with man. It was one way in the law. It was one way with Moses. It was a, it, it, and as we see throughout time periods in the, in the Bible, he works in different ways with man. And right now we're in the age of grace. God is showing us a lot of grace. Remember the ground would open up and swallow people? Tonight, I think there'd be a lot of people not on earth if that was happening. Right? So we live in an age of grace. God's working with man in a different way than he has in the past. And so this sermon there, uh, kind of chasing the rabbit there, but we get back to verse number five. When he was entered into Capernaum, notice, he's busy. He's calling disciples. He's pouring his heart into people. He kind of moves to this mountain so he's able to teach. When he's done teaching, what happens? Here comes some more needy people. And listen, if you're going to be in ministry or you're going to give yourself to the Lord to serve, guess what's going to come to you? Guess what you're going to have to deal with? Needy people. We can't get tired of needy people. And as a church family, guess what's coming to you and I? What's coming to our church? Because they have needs. They're living out there in a world. They're, they're living in the world that, God, that Satan is the God of this world. They're living in chaos. They're living in all kinds of depression and seeking all kinds of things. And when they come to the church, they're hurting people. They're needy people. And when they come in here, they ought to find something that is completely different from the world. They ought to find people that love God, that love people, that want to reach out to them, that are willing to give of themselves to help them out. And so that's what Christ does. As he's teaching and as he's coming down, he doesn't say, oh, brother, here comes another one. How can I help you, sir? And here comes the centurion with another uh, need. And so Christ is there for him. There's a large natural amphitheater here in this side of the mountain. And that's why they believe that this is where he was. Uh, it's, it's an area in the hill called Mount Aremos, Aremos uh, that can easily fit a large multitude of people. Uh, the Byzantines built a church there in the 4th century. A Catholic church exists there today. It was built by the Italians in 1938. So fairly recently that this new church, this Catholic church has been erected there. Um, but it, it will hold that many people. When Pope John Paul II visited the site in the year 2000, the place was prepared to hold 100,000 plus people. So it's a big area. But the but the the natural way that it sits there, somebody can sit up a little bit higher and speak out to the people in this amphitheater. And with a loud voice, he can carry out through the crowds. And so this is a perfect place for Christ to go up and to begin teaching the people, the multitudes that are there. And so although they, in 2000, it was set up for 100,000 people, not that many showed up because there was rain in the area. Um, but it just goes to show that it, it could have held great multitudes of people. All right, number two, let's look tonight. Not only is the location of, of where the sermon was preached, we can see the time of year when it was preached, all right? Look in, um, let's go to John chapter 6 first. Let's go to John chapter 6. John chapter 6. Let's start in verse number 1. The Bible says in John 6 verse 1, After these things, Jesus went over the Sea of Galilee, which is the Sea of Tiberias. A great multitude followed him because they saw his miracles, which he did on them that were diseased. And so, listen with me, as, as we mentioned before, Mark, Matthew might see it one way. That's his perspective. That's his side of the story. Mark sees it a little bit differently. Luke might see it different from a different direction, a different perspective. The story they're telling is the exact same. It's just God gives them a little bit of liberty uh, to pen and to put in their character, their little bit of personality into the writing. Uh, we said a couple weeks ago the same way that inspiration is like a, a pen in the hand of God. And God used the pen of Matthew and God used the pen of Mark and Luke and John. But one might be a gel pen. One might be a little ballpoint pen. One might be a bit versus a generic type pen. And so it has its own little personality. It has its own little flair to it, yet it's under control of the inspiration of God. And so as they each tell their kind of perspective, we see here that Matthew kind of gives the people the benefit of the doubt. They're there to hear, they want the miracles, but 
Matthew doesn't really point it out, but that's the fact. Mark here says the reason they were there, verse 2, was to see the miracles which he did on them that were diseased. Hey Amen. Let's go see this guy. I hear he does some incredible things. Yeah, but if you heard him preach, we're not interested in that. We just want to see him heal somebody. We want to see the miracles. Verse number 3, Jesus went up into a mountain, and there he sat with his disciples. In the Passover, a feast of the Jews was nigh, and when Jesus then lifted up his eyes, he saw a great company come unto him. And so he begins there to feed them. He, he asks the questions. He had, finds the fish and the loaves, and he does the miracle. Verse number 10, Jesus said, Make the men sit down. Now there was much grass in the place, so the men sat down in number, about 5,000. And so we see the timing of this message is going to be in the spring. Uh, we see that there was grass in the area. This for the rainy time of the year is in the spring. We also see the other indication in verse number 4, the Passover, a feast of the Jews, was not. We're getting ready to celebrate Easter, right? We call it Easter. America calls it Easter. It's the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The Amen. resurrection of our Savior in the spring of the year. Okay, so as we celebrate the resurrection, we see here that was the Passover. The Passover, the Lamb of God was slain on the cross for mankind. That pure, sinless, perfect Lamb of God. The Passover. Okay, so that's what we see here. The Passover, the feast of the Jews was not. So indications that is the spring time of the year. Look at Mark chapter 6. Mark chapter 6, and we'll simply see there in Mark 6, verse number 39. Mark chapter 6, and verse number 39. The Bible says, as he's feeding them there, uh, he says he commanded them to make all sit down like companies upon the green grass. And so we got green grass in the area. Again, the rainy part of the season the rainy part of the year, this early spring when everything's green and growing. I look out at the trees sitting in, in the back porch the other day studying and everything is green and beautiful right now. Everything's sprouting brand new things. The little vine covering our um, lattice over there is about to knock the thing over. It's got so much growth on it and so many uh, new blossoms and stuff. I was watching the other day, we were standing there talking and something out of the corner of my eye caught my attention but it stopped and I couldn't figure out. I said, I think I saw a bird fly by, but I don't know where he went. And then yesterday I'm on the back porch and this little bird flies by and he goes right into the top hole of the basketball court. He's building a nest in there. He's about to have babies, or she's about to have babies. Um, it's the springtime of the year. It's a beautiful time of the year. Everything's brand new and fresh. And we get these fresh rains that go through and things that we see God's blessing in. So that's the time of this sermon on the mountain. So we see where it was. It was in a mountain, a big uh, amphitheater type area where Christ can teach a lot of people. We see that it's in this springtime of the year. The third thing we want to see tonight uh, is let's compare the Sermon on the Mount to other sermons in the Gospel. And we would say that parts of the sermon are preached other places and other times. And what I mean by that is that these were common themes in Jesus' preaching. Uh, sometimes, you know, my wife helps me out. She helps me out. She's like, you always use that verse. You're always going to that topic. Well, that's my, maybe what's on my mind. Maybe in my Bible reading, that's where we're at. Maybe as I'm studying, the Lord lays something on my mind and and it, it kind of goes back to a theme that we've talked about. And I've heard other pastors, you know, you might say, well, that's kind of his favorite thing. But, but Jesus is using the themes in this Sermon on the Mount and throughout the Gospels will come back to reoccurring themes. And he'll use those things. And, and he had a way of taking life application. What's going on in your life? Maybe you're a farmer. Maybe you're a shepherd. Maybe you're a physician, Luke. And God takes those stories and he uh, personalizes them for the life of the person. And so it's a common theme. And so he didn't always cover every part of the message. He's not always going to preach chapters 5, 6, and 7 every time, but he might. And other times he might just take part of chapter 5, or he might take part of chapter 7, and he applies it to the crowd or the group that he's with. And so it was, it was um, this was the core, though, of his itinerant message. As he moved about, as he moved around the people, as he interacted, this was the core of his message. And what is he saying? Well, through, through Matthew 5 and 7, we'll see that the simple message is a proclamation of how God expects us to live. And if you think back to our messages as we took each one of the attitudes and we broke them down, what's the blessing side of it? And what's God saying? How does it go contrary to the thoughts of man? You know, if I'm meek, people are going to run me over in life, especially as a police officer. I'd better not take me. God saying, be meek, be kind. That is, meekness is power under control. The ability of God, the power of God in your lives, but not letting it go to your head. Treating people the way they ought to be treated. How Christ will treat them. Ah, he says, give. But, but if I give, what's going to happen? And God 
process this again. Be, be that. And so I am trying to go from memory to Matthew chapter 5. Has it? Blessed are the poor in spirit, the humility, the humble that we ought to be. These go contrary to the religious Jews at the time. It was contrary to what they thought. It was contrary to how they lived. It was contrary to how they taught. But Christ is now showing us how a Christian, somebody in a relationship with Jesus Christ, ought to live and ought to treat people. It's contrary to the natural thinking of man today. What's going on in our world? Chaos. Why? Because that's my carbon spot. Why is it yours? Because I saw it first? No, I saw it first. I didn't have my blinker on. I was being patient to turn in, and you cut me off. Because God can bless me if I just simply let you go. But God also, like we said this morning, He can open storehouses and He can close storehouses. God can allow blessings. God can take away blessings. I can walk a few more steps. It won't hurt me to do so. It means that God has the glory in my life. Many commentary, uh, commentators believe that He often preached this sermon or used themes from it. Uh, many of them will say as He traveled, this is the things that He preached often. Uh, let's look at a couple of places where these parallels go. Uh, look in Matthew chapter 5, verse 29 and 30. Matthew 5, 29 and 30. And then we're going to compare it with Mark chapter 9. Mark chapter 9. Alright, Matthew chapter 5, look at verse number 29 and 30. The Bible says, And if thy right eye offend thee, walk it out. Cast it from thee, for it is profitable for thee that one of thy members should perish, and not that thy whole body should be cast into hell. And if thy right hand offend thee, cut it off and cast it from thee, for it is profitable for thee that one of thy members should perish, and not that thy whole body should be cast into hell. When we look at that, we might say, man, he's not serious. I don't know that I would want to do that. But God's saying, take it seriously. Take it so seriously that we'd rather go without one eye, go without one hand, than to offend, uh, or to end up in, in outside of a relationship with Jesus Christ and to be cast into hell. You know, that's another verse that comes to mind. What should it profit a man if he gained the whole world? There's a lot of things in this world. You could amass a lot of riches, and it's not going to do you any good the moment that trumpet sounds and you don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ. Right. Right. All right. So it's a different crowd he's talking to now in, in Mark chapter 9. Look at Mark chapter 9, verse number 43. Mark chapter 9 and verse number 43. When we get to verse number 42, we see that he says, Whosoever shall offend one of these little ones that believes in me, it is better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck and he were cast into the sea. Let's stop right there. Somebody needs to print this out and just send it to the Pope, right? Send it to the Catholic Church. Uh, but there's some Baptist pastors, there's some youth pastors, there's some workers who did these, some other people better off, he says, that a millstone was hanged about your neck and cast into the sea, and that you would offend a little one that loves God, that believes in Christ. Amen. That's serious. Right. God doesn't mess around when it comes to that type of stuff. Verse number 43, if thy hand offend thee, cut it off. It's better for thee to enter into life maimed than to have two hands and go into hell, into the fire that never shall be quenched. Where the worm dies not, the fire is not quenched. And if thy foot offend thee, cut it off. It is better for thee to enter all in the life than having two feet to be cast into hell, into the fire that never shall be quenched. Where the worm dies not, and the fire is not quenched. If thy eye offend thee, pluck it out. It is better for thee to enter into the kingdom of God with one eye than having two eyes to be cast into hell fire. Where the worm dies not, and the fire is not quenched. And so we see the same idea, the same teaching, and yet he's expounding. In Matthew, we don't see anything about hell. And yet in Mark, we see this teaching on hell there. And so we see the same message, the same topics, but it's expounded upon. It's, it's added to with this topic of hell. And so Christ is teaching on it. It's a different crowd and a different situation. Uh, here in Mark 9, he's addressing the disciples privately. Look at verse number 31. In um, Mark chapter 9, verse 31, he says there, For he taught his disciples. And said unto them, The Son of Man is delivered into the hands of men. And so he's beginning to, uh, again, teach them as he's moving towards the cross. And he's teaching the disciples specifically. Back in Matthew, what did we see? The multitudes are following him. He primarily, I believe, is teaching the disciples. 
when he's addressing a multitude of people. Okay? Um, and so those are the, some of the differences. In contrast, after the Sermon on, on the Mount in Matthew, we see Christ go back to Capernaum. Here in Mark chapter number 10, verse number 1, it says that he goes, uh, <coughs> sorry, after preaching, he goes uh, into the coast of Judea by the far side of Jordan, Mark 10, 1. And so one place he's going back to Capernaum, the other place he's going uh, into a different place, uh, into the side of the, by the pool. Okay. Uh, let's look at another one in, in Matthew 5, and then we'll go to Luke 6. Uh, in Matthew 5, it's another crowd, another situation. In the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew is preaching on a mountain. Uh, in Luke chapter 6, or Luke chapter 6. This is how we understand the frequent references to your father. Look at Matthew chapter 5, 
uh, verse number 16. Matthew 5 and verse 16. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father, which is in heaven. That's the disciples. That's the followers. That's those that were trusting Christ. The rest of the multitude, God's not their Father. The God of this world is their Father. All right, look at verse number 45, Matthew 5 and verse 45. That ye may be the children of your Father, which is in heaven. For he maketh the sun to rise on the evil and on the good, and sendeth rain on the just and the unjust. Verse number 48, Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. Look at verse number 1 of chapter 6. Take heed that ye do not your alms before men to be seen of them, otherwise ye have no reward of your Father which is in heaven. So he's speaking to the disciples, the followers, those that have a relationship. And that is God their Father. God is their Father the others, the God of this world is their father. And so there is, uh, let me see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten other references in the Sermon on the Mount to our Father as he speaks to the disciples there. Christ would not tell the mixed multitude to pray to our Father which art in heaven when he told the Pharisees that they were the children of the devil. John 8, 44. The God of this world has blinded the eyes of men. He told Nicodemus, except the man be born again, he cannot see so this is the first reference to God as the Father in Christ's ministry. And remember on Wednesday night, talking about wine, we said the law of first mention in Bible interpretation. When I see a first mention of something, when I see something that is indicated the first time, there's a meaning there. There's something that is going to carry through the rest of the scripture. He may expound on it, he may add to it, but there's a characteristic there that is going to carry through uh, for the rest of the time. Alright, so we see this, that this is the first time God is mentioned as the Father, uh, but now it's a Old Testament truth that wasn't really seen um, or taught prominently in the Old Testament, that now is a New Testament truth um, and was revealed by the incarnation of the Son of God. That is Christ in the flesh, God in flesh on earth. Alright, so in the Gospel, suddenly Jehovah God of the Old Testament is the Father, Son, and Spirit of the New. This is not explained, it's not argued. It's not proven. It's simply declared. Let me take you to another thought. Genesis 1 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Amen. No argument, no discussion, no proving it. Here it is declared. Believe it or don't. But the truth is declared. John 1 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. No argument, no proof, no discussion. Or you know. And so Christ puts it out there. There's no indication in the sermon, there's no indication following the sermon that the disciples had any question, any problem believing in the doctrine of the Trinity. As a matter of fact, they'll begin to teach it here in the next couple of chapters as they go about. Some parts of this message are definitely addressed to the larger audience. Uh, look in Matthew chapter 7 as we kind of close out this message. Matthew chapter 7, Christ begins to wrap it up. Notice in verse 13 and 14, he says, Enter ye in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction. And many be many there be which go in thereat, because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. What happens in a message like we preached this morning? Or were we preaching to saved or unsaved primarily this morning? Saved. Those that are going to give because of a relationship with Jesus Christ. Those that understand the character of God and that if God says give and I will give unto you, give in measure and I'll give back to you in proportion, that's a Christian needs to understand that. But how do we wrap up the message? God made provision for you too. If you're not saved this morning, there's provision for you. There's a way to be saved. And whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. So we wrap up a message primarily to Christians with an opportunity, an invitation to the gospel message. And so Christ begins to do the same thing, although primarily speaking to the disciples, although primarily just teaching truth to the disciples, here's the message for the multitude. Enter in at the narrow gate. There is opportunity. You can be saved too. Here's the invitation. Few there be that will find it. Look at verse number 21. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. But he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many will say to me in 
that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name, and in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works? What are they basing it on? What they've done. The works, not the relationship. And then I will profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me. Ye that work in it. What a sad, sad day to me. Therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them, I will liken him unto a wise man who built his house upon the rock. And the rain descended, the floods came, and the winds blew, beat upon that house, and fell not, for it was founded upon the rock. And every one that heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them not shall be likened unto a foolish man which built his house upon the sand. And the rain descended, the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat upon that house, and fell, and great was the fall of it. King of Pastor Jesus had ended these sayings. The people were astonished at this doctrine, for he taught them as one having authority, not as a scribe. Again, we come full circle. We see the message is complete. He's given an invitation. Whosoever will may come, the decision is yours. And now he goes back. It says he moves back into the burning. And here comes the centurion for another need. All right, as we uh, wrap up tonight, let's look at two more verses. There's false, there's the warnings here about false professions. And, a, and not having a relationship with Christ. Look at 2 Corinthians 13 5. 2 Corinthians 13 5. Look at two more verses. 2 Corinthians 13 5. The Bible says, Examine yourselves, whether ye be in the faith. Prove your own selves. Know ye not that your own selves, how that Jesus Christ is in you, except you be reprobates. You know the first two words there, examine yourself. When I go to the doctor, I don't really care to go. I, I try not to go. <laughs> but sometimes my wife says, you need to go. You haven't had a physical in a couple years. It's time to go. So I go in there, and the doctor's like, take your shirt off. Huh? I don't even really like having my shirt off. I put my pocket flip on the doctor. <laughs> okay? But he takes out some tools, maybe a, a mic magnifying glass. He looks at my ears. He looks in your eyes. He takes out a stethoscope and he listens to your heart. He takes out a little rubber hammer and he knocks on my knees and makes my legs jump. He feels funny and I'm like, come on, man. This time come good and go. He's examining. And God says, you don't need a doctor. You don't need a pastor. You don't need a priest. Examine yourself. Do you have a relationship with Jesus Christ? A personal relationship, or do you not? And he says the indication there in the end of the verse is, are you reprobate or not? Prove your own selves. Know ye not your own selves how that Jesus Christ is in you, except you be reprobate. Just listen. You cannot lose your salvation. If you ask Christ to save you, he will save you. But I'm afraid there's a lot of people that go through the motions. Well, this is what mom wants. better off not having an arm. You'd be better off not having an eye. You'd be better off not having a leg. I can't imagine going through this life. I'm thankful that I've never had an injury that's taken a limb. But I can't imagine going through life like that. But God says it'd be far better to go through life that way than to end up in a lake of fire when God has offered you eternal life in heaven. Let's look at one more. Hebrews chapter 3. Examine yourselves tonight. You know if you're saved. Hebrews chapter 3. Look at verse number 12. Hebrews 3. Verse number 12. Hebrews 3.12. The Bible says, Take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. Again, take heed, pay attention, listen up, brethren. And I think the, the indicator is that we would normally only call people that are saved brethren. But Paul's addressing Christians sitting in a church, Christians. We're addressing a church crowd tonight. We're addressing the, con the uh, congregation. So as far as I know, everybody in here is saved. But Paul's saying, take hey, heed, brethren, in a general sense. And if you're not saved, if you have some evil... Um, if you look, uh, three, four, uh, an evil heart of unbelief. 
you're doing it for grandma, you're doing it for mom, you're doing it for some other reason, or you never really knew Christ as your Savior, you've never trusted Him, tonight's the night to do it. Unless you have an equal part of unbelief and departing from the living God, that's the only way you can depart. You've never had a real relationship. Because once you're saved, you can't lose it. Verse number 13, he says, But exhort one another daily, while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. What was the core message of the Sermon on the Mount? If you've got a relationship with God, here's how you ought to live. It ought to change your life. It should make you a different person. There should be some fruit on your tree. There ought to be some indicators that somebody can look at you and say, yes, that's a Christian, and here's how I can prove it, just looking at the outside. And so he says here, examine yourselves. Exhort one another daily. You know, it kind of gets me to people that say, well, I don't really need church three times a week. I don't really need it. He's saying, exhort one another daily. I need it every day. Not only do I get in my Bible every day. I appreciate when somebody texts me and says, I'm praying for you. And, hey, Pastor, how's things going? What's happening? It, it exhorts me. It causes me to think spiritually. It gets me back to the right frame of mind. It's a blessing. And I try to do that for other people as well. We need exhortation every day, not one time. Bless any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. No, it's easy to miss one church service. It's kind of easy to miss a couple. But when it begins to not bother you anymore, it's, oh, it's the deceitfulness of a hard heart. Because the tugging of God that says, listen, you should be a Christian tonight, is no longer there. The bugging of the Holy Spirit in your mind that says, hey, Christian, you should be in church tonight, goes away. You never deceived by the hardness of That was the message, the proclamation of the Sermon on the Mount. How are you living? God expresses it.